Intel, being the somewhat new kid on the block when it comes to discrete graphics, has finally released their Alchemist lineup of GPUs. Even though I'm a few months late to the party, drivers have matured a lot in the month and a half since launch, and I wanted to go over some of the issues I'm still experiencing, as well as some of the things I'm noticing that the card does well. Right off the bat, I think it's important to mention that this video is going to be light on benchmark and performance data, as I'll be saving the majority of it for my full review of the card. What we'll be discussing today is more so overarching experiences I've been seeing online that are consistent with what I've been seeing with the card. What's probably going to affect this card's value to a lot of gamers is inconsistent performance in games utilizing older graphics APIs. What I mean by this is games such as CSGO, which utilize DirectX 9, run into performance issues that can either hinder or kill your prospects of acquiring one of these cards. Admittedly, in Intel's 3rd of December driver update, performance almost doubled in a lot of these older games, including the aforementioned CSGO, so things are definitely improving. It's just taking time. For newer titles that utilize DirectX 12 and or Vulkan, the performance will improve dramatically, thanks to these newer APIs favoring lower level access to the hardware. In general, this translates to better shader occupancy and an overall improvement to the graphical processing efficiency and feature set found within your GPU. This applies to almost all graphics cards that are built with newer APIs in mind. However, given Nvidia's and AMD's legacy hardware that they've been working on for over a decade now, their newer architectures don't suffer from the same performance penalties when switching to older, more fragmented rendering solutions. If anything, Intel has proven that they're capable of reworking their software stack to improve performance. And with the evident changes to their DX9 to DX12 translation layer that they pushed with their December 3rd driver update, it's just proof that they're capable of providing performance and compatibility improvements for older software. It's something that needs to be brought up though, as you may need to wait for performance to improve if you play specific older games, as not everything is guaranteed to work 100%. Just for example, one of my favorite games, Black Ops 3, which has some amazing custom zombies maps, doesn't launch, but the mod tools, which I would think would be significantly more demanding or prone to causing issues, launch without an issue and everything is rendered improperly. This may be fixed in a future driver update, but as of the recording of this video, I can't launch the game and it just crashes back to the desktop without a DirectX error. It's strange and isolated, but it still affects the card. Graphics errors also occur infrequently, but when they do, they're generally persistent. In Red Dead Redemption 2, turning on FSR 2 causes the world to get progressively darker while the mouse is stationary. Black Ops 1 has a depth of field shader error where everything is blurred way more than it should be. Sometimes when loading into a Minecraft RTX world, everything except particle effects will be black. These are just some errors I've found, but I'm sure more exist. It will probably get fixed eventually, but for now these issues prevent me from playing certain games on certain settings, which is kind of a shame. Besides API performance, resizable bar is a requirement on this GPU, and without it, you'll get worse performance on average and it'll be significantly more stuttery. I think that's a word. I turned it off to run some benchmarks, and I ended up just turning it back on because it felt so bad to play games with. Now this makes sense from a technical perspective as to why you would need this feature enabled. After all, when gaming, if you look closely, you'll see it starts using more memory than it has on board, and that's because of resizable bar. It also allows the GPU to access CPU memory in a more direct manner over the PCIe bus. But just know that if you're not rocking a PCIe 4.0 and resizable bar capable motherboard and CPU, then it's not even worth considering one of the Alchemist cards. Another thing I think needs to be brought up is the fact that the card isn't as tweakable as other cards on the market. Right after installing this card, I was disappointed to learn that the telemetry doesn't hook up to MSI Afterburner or GPU-Z, meaning you get null values and can't adjust clock settings. Quick update, while writing this video I updated GPU-Z and now it detects all the specifications for the A750, so that point's kinda mute, but for MSI Afterburner unfortunately you still can't edit values. I was kind of frustrated, but then I discovered you could press Alt-O to bring up the Intel Performance Telemetry Overlay, and it gives me so much more information than I was looking for. From things like GPU usage, voltage, clocks, to temperature, 
You get pretty standard information, however, you also get more detailed information such as the media engine activity, the VRAM temperature, the GPU core power, and even the GDDR6 memory clocks and transfer rate. If you're looking to just game on this card and use this overlay as an MSI Afterburner replacement, you'll probably want to stick to the core four settings, GPU usage, clocks, temps, and memory usage, but the extra settings are something that's nice to have for someone like me who likes to see what their hardware is doing. However, as for the tunability of the card, the only performance affecting settings that you can change are the GPU power limit and the slider called GPU Performance Boost, which can be set at any integer value from 0 to 100. When I set the slider to 100, the card's core and VRAM clocks remain the same as when the slider is set to 0, so I'm honestly not sure what this setting does, but it's there and may turn out to do something else under the hood that I'm just simply not aware of. Equally as important as some of the issues of the card, I think it's important to mention what I like about it, as well as some of the strengths. First, the microarchitecture powering the Alchemist lineup of GPUs has a higher percentage of overall transistors dedicated to ray tracing than AMD's RDNA 2 cards. The performance of this flavor of the Z high performance graphics architecture features ray tracing cores that are more comparable to what Nvidia's Ampere cards offer, making this card technically ray tracing compatible. When it comes to actual ray tracing performance though, it falls in line ahead of the AMD RX 6600, but behind the RTX 3060. What the ARC A750 has that the AMD cards don't have is a Tensor Core equivalent. Intel designed the ZHPG microarchitecture to utilize their XMX cores, which do matrix operations. They're each 1024 bits wide and function similarly to how AVX512 operates on the CPU. To actually access the matrix hardware on Intel cards, you can simply write a program utilizing Intel's 1API's intrinsic-like functions, which, like I mentioned, is similar to how you'd access an SSC or AVX-capable piece of hardware. It is, at least in my experience, more straightforward than writing code for NVIDIA's Tensor Cores, and when it comes to writing something like a hardware-accelerated Python library, it simplifies things greatly as you can just write C++ code in a regular C++ file. You also get more of these cores in total than the A750, with the competitor's RTX 3060 coming in with only 112 tensor cores. Meanwhile, the A750 sports 448 XMX cores, which when running software such as ZSS, really shows the grunt that these cores possess. When comparing the specifications of this card to the aforementioned 3060 though, it matches it in FP32 shader count, but actually features double the amount of texture mapping units, and over doubles the amount of ROPs to 112. The FP32 cores also allow for the processing of packed half floats, which Nvidia removed with Ampere and Ada, so should the need arise, you're able to roughly double your data throughput as long as you're willing to sacrifice some precision. The die also features 16 megabytes of L2 cache, which while smaller than AMD's Infinity caches, is leagues ahead of what NVIDIA offers in their Ampere cards. When it comes to rendering at higher resolutions though, the rasterization engine should make the Intel card more capable than the 3060, but in reality it falls behind it, possibly due to some under the hood issues. When looking at the die featured in this card, it's actually larger than and features over 4 billion more transistors than the RTX 3070 Ti. Chances are that not all 21.7 billion transistors in the full chip are active in this cutdown one, but this does show that the card has leagues more transistors than the 3070, but it performs a bit slower than a 3060. This disconnect between available hardware and theoretical performance is kind of puzzling, but with Intel's proven ability to fix issues, I suspect that performance will become much better once developers are given time to write software for the hardware that Intel is putting in these cards but for the here and now, it still has a lot of maturing to do. Another aspect of the card that I like a lot more than I thought I would have is the media engine. AV1 Encode is a feature that I honestly didn't think too much about, but after doing some media creation using it, it's honestly an incredible technology. Just to give you an idea as to what I'm talking about, for my last YouTube short video, I uploaded it in an H.264 codec. The entire video takes up just under 79 megabytes on my hard drive, which admittedly isn't huge, but when comparing to the AV1 encoded version, it comes in at 8 megabytes. 
Once YouTube finally accepts AV1 encoded video, it's going to allow for either much higher quality with the same bandwidth, or the same quality we have today requiring less bandwidth. It will allow for more videos to be stored and streamed per unit area, and from my end means that videos won't take as long to upload. It's cool from a technical perspective as well because I'm personally used to my longer videos being tens of gigabytes in size, and with AV1 it gets down to a more manageable couple of gigabytes. This codec is going to become way more of a thing as we move into the future, but having the ability to hardware accelerate it is something that may help to future-prove this card against other Ampere and RDNA2 offerings. An aspect of the card that I do enjoy a lot and was looking forward to, especially after my previous video dissecting ZSS on my 3070 Ti, is how much better ZSS looks on an Intel card. Performance-wise, it seems to exhibit behavior similar to what I observed on my NVIDIA card, as 1% lows weren't really improved a whole lot, but the average and maximums improved roughly linearly with each decrease in setting. I think that this technology has a lot of potential when it comes to providing an alternative to DLSS, and when it comes to running natively on Intel hardware, it looks very clean. It does have some ghosting like what you'd see with DLSS, but it also doesn't get blurry like DLSS does when you set it to lower settings. Don't get me wrong, detail is still definitely lost, but it seems to handle it in a different way that, to me at least, is subjectively superior to how DLSS handles distant details. Really my only complaint with the technology is that I wish it was found in more games, because the couple that currently support it are fun but are limiting in what they showcase. If it were a slower paced game such as Red Dead Redemption 2, I would be able to pixel peep way more, and also get an idea as to how it improves performance across a wider variety of games. There's a long road ahead of Intel when it comes to adoption of their technology, but from what's available I think it's a promising start. All in all, my impression of the ARC A750 is that the card has come a long way from its initial launch performance, but it still has a ways to go. The biggest complaint I have about the card if I had to formulate one is that the older API support could still use some work. Things have improved a ton, so we have reason to believe that work is being done behind the scenes to fix these performance issues, but the timeframe as to when these fixes will release is really anyone's guess. If I could wrap up my thoughts in a single phrase, it would be, I like the ARC A750. I mean, it's by no means the fastest or most efficient card on the market, but for someone who likes to program for GPUs, it provides an interesting new yet somewhat familiar programming model that's fun to pick up, and is probably the closest CUDA-like experience you'll get on a non-CUDA compatible device. Gaming performance is also definitely interesting because we're seeing fine wine happen on a faster scale than we're used to. We've seen an almost doubling of performance in CSGO with recent driver releases, so we know that the hardware is there, it just needs to be quote unquote fixed, which you can't really do but they're making it work. I can't wait to share my full thoughts on the ARC A750 in my full review. I'm going to have way more performance benchmarks than usual, so be prepared. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you think of this card, and whether or not you have experience with it. I'm interested to see how many people own an Intel ARC card, though I suspect it's not very many. Either way, stay tuned for my RK750 review. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.